when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, got a couple of tables that are kind of covered with cool things. This is our Operation Christmas Child packing party today, directly after the service. So if you got a few minutes or a couple hours to hang out afterwards, we're going to pack up all these supplies. Now remember, these Operation Christmas Child boxes, it's not just gifts. I mean, they're gifts, but it's not just gifts. Wherever these boxes are brought around the world, they share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people as they receive them. And so volunteering for a little while to help here to pack these boxes up is a great way to help promote the gospel spread around the world. So if you have time today, please hang out after for that. Next Saturday, we're going to be having our Girl Scouts will be putting on a, uh, an event for veterans. So this is for veterans that need warm clothes, warm blankets, hats, mittens, those types of things. If you got some time next Saturday, you can come and hang out and help out with that event. I want to give you a heads up about that. And then one last thing. Did you know that we're just a couple weeks away from Thanksgiving? Yeah? Did you guys know that we do a Thanksgiving dinner right here at church after the service? Nobody knew about that? In your bulletin, there's a little list that you look through to see what kind of things you can bring along to the dinner. So pay attention. Come out for that. We're going to have a wonderful time enjoying each other's company, enjoying each other's fellowship. Great time to meet new people, sit down with people, and talk with folks you don't normally know. So please come out for that, um, the week of Thanksgiving. And what's the exact date of it? It's the 17th? 21st, the 21st Sunday. All right, everybody, could you stand up? We'll continue with our musical worship this morning. Good morning, everyone. Remember that uh, we have the privilege of sharing communion today. So as we prepare our hearts for that, remember the price that he paid for us, the new covenant that he put in place. So as we prepare our hearts and mind to receive communion, let's sing together and remember. I take the bread of life, broken for all my sin, your body crucified to make me whole. Hallelujah. 
book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we learn about what communion is about. And many people think that communion is a time where you just eat some bread and drink some juice and maybe think some positive things about Jesus. But what we find in the pages of 1 Corinthians 11 is that it's so much more. It's this time that we together remember what Jesus did together. And the attitude in which we take it is critically important. As a matter of fact, in the passage, there's people that are taking part in communion, but some people are taking so much communion that they're getting drunk, and some people don't have any communion at all. And the Apostle Paul says, you're not having communion because you're not sharing it together. You're not viewing it in the right light. He says, in order to take communion correctly, you have to be remembering what Jesus did for us. You're taking time to remember together. And he actually says, take a moment before you participate and, and examine your conscience and make sure that you are good with God. Now, here's the thing, my friends. When I heard that when I was a kid, I'd get very worried because I'd say, you know what? I do wrong things all the time. And so week after week, I would take communion because I'd be looking there. I'd be afraid, well, if I don't, then my parents are going to think that there's something wrong with me. And then at the same time, I'd be like, well, maybe God's mad at me because maybe I'm not worthy. My friends, what we need to understand is the gospel of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died, was buried, and resurrected for us. So he provides the good works that you need to be saved. When you participate in communion, you are remembering what he did for you. I'm going to give about 15 seconds of quiet because we got little ones that are paying attention. It's hard for them to, to be quiet. We, but even this is for you kids. Do you know that sometimes when we do things wrong, all we need to do is we go to God and we ask him to forgive us. We ask him for his grace and he wants to do that for us. So we're going to have a few moments of quiet. And then we'll go through communion together. All right, so with just the music, let's have some quiet. pray your prayers of pardon over your people, over your children, and over your grown-ups who are here. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come afresh on this group and that you will restore each of us. Those of us that have been doing the wrong things, have been living in sin, we bear our hearts before you, God, and say we're sorry for the ways in which we failed. And we are so grateful for your sacrifice. We're so grateful for what you did for us. Thank you for inviting us to your table to remember what you did for us together. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it starts this way. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat it, my friends. Eat it, my friends. It's Jesus' body broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My friends, with great thanks, with great thanks, we drink together the new covenant, the new cup of the new covenant. God, our Father, we thank you for the miracle of sending Jesus to us, for his shed blood on the cross for us. We remember him together in gratitude for what he did, and we proclaim no other name under which men can be saved than the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the love that you give to your people. We will sing to you with joy-filled hearts because of what you did for us. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Nowhere we can be that is too far for the amazing grace of God.
God to reach us. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered lifted and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free Father God, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross for our sins. Jesus, you paid the debt that we would never be able to pay so that we could have everlasting life with you one day. Father, as we've taken this time to remember your sacrifice and remember your love, it's so important to continue to walk through that remembrance and to be thankful, as Luke said to do it with a thankful heart, a heart of understanding. Father, I lift up 
everyone in this room and everyone watching online today. Many are broken, many are hurting, and they just need you. They just need to remember that you're there, that you've always been there, and you will continue to always be there. I lift those burdens up to you today as we all kneel at your throne, Father. You're the King of kings. We come before you today. Be with Pastor Luke today as he brings the word and with Joe Welsh as he reads your word for your people today, Father. Stir something up in us. Let us feel your presence today. In the name of of our only Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm telling you guys, there's nothing I like more than hearing the sound of children in a sanctuary during a worship service. That means that God has not left us behind. It means that he has a hope for his next generation and it's beginning here today. Little ones, we love you so dearly and we're so glad that you're here with us. We're going to keep you little ones here a little bit longer because I want you to hear the reading of God's word. You may not understand everything that Joe is going to read to you today, but I want you to pay attention because guess what? You won't understand it until you do. So, Joe, would you please keep, come up and read the word for us today? This is from Romans chapter 13, from 1 to 7. And this is a sermon and a passage that I'm very excited about. So take it away for us, my friend. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. And therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Praise God for the reading of his word. We love God's word and love to have it read. All right, children, you are dismissed. We love you guys. You guys did so good listening to the reading of the word. So proud of you guys. Well done. Well done. Does anybody go through their day with concerns about the direction of our nation. A couple of you aren't paying attention. 
Now, you may have disagreements about whether that means that our policy should be more left-leaning or should be more right-leaning, but we seem to share concern that things are not as they ought to be. And my friends, I myself am a person who have always struggled to respect authority that I don't think is legitimate for any of a number of reasons. All right, I was in the Navy Sea Cadets when I was in high school. I was 14 years old, and we were off at Newport Navy Base for a boot camp experience. And I'm one of 30 cadets that's in a company, and we were there on Tuesday morning about to learn which of us cadets was about to be promoted to help the 17-year-old kid who was in charge be his assistant. And I got to say... I had a pretty high opinion of my abilities. Nobody drilled like me. Nobody's uniform was crisper. Nobody had that get it done kind of attitude. And I was sitting there waiting for them to read out my name when I heard the name of the prettiest girl in the whole squad being promoted to be the 17-year-old kid's assistant. Now... At the time, I was such a sexist that it's completely possible that she was more qualified than me in every way. But at the time, I was pretty sure I knew why she had the position. And so I went through the next several days doing just enough to get by, to not put my head up, But at every chance I got, I would undermine this young lady's authority. And it was one day on a Thursday or a Friday that I was making a rather sexist remark out loud when all of a sudden the guy that was in charge caught my attention and he said something along the lines of, if you can't respect authority over you, what makes you think you should have any? It's an interesting thought. Well, my friends, I've always had a higher opinion of my abilities, my thinking, my way of doing things that makes it very difficult for me to subject myself to anybody. When you hear this passage beginning in verse 13, verse 1, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. When it says it that twice, it makes it very hard for me to believe that because of the way that I'm wired and the way that I think. But as we look together at the way the Bible fits together, we're going to put a slide up here. This is from our 30 Days to Understanding the Bible class. This is a class we offer about quarterly. Right now I'm doing it with Haley Brown and with Tia. And this is a way that shows how the Bible fits together, sort of 10 different wedges. And it begins in creation. All right? It begins in creation. I've got my little whiteboard over here. In creation, when God first creates the heavens and the earth, there is no government structure. It's essentially an anarchy. All right? Everybody does whatever they want to do. In fact, Adam and Eve's son, Cain, kills his brother, Abel, and there's no police to arrest him. There's no judicial system to do anything with it. But even in the creation story, we see that God still speaks, God still moves, and God is still among his people. We go to the second section, the section of the patriarchs. So now we move from an anarchy to a tribalism. Okay, so you've got one leader, Abraham, and he's got his family. He's got servants, he's got slaves, he's got maids, he's got soldiers, but every, every decision that is made is made by Abraham. It is a tribal government system. There's no votes. If you don't agree with Grandpa Abraham, it doesn't matter what you think. Abraham's in charge. Even in the tribal system, God still speaks, God still moves, and God's still among his people. The third movement is that of the Exodus. So the people of Israel find themselves in slavery in Egypt under a monarchy. They don't get a vote. They don't get a say. They don't get to decide what happens. God delivers them out of Egypt, and now they become some kind of a theocracy. But how many people are still in charge? One. You've got Moses, and Moses, whatever he says goes. And matter of fact, people try to say, well, that's not fair. We should be sharing authority around here. And God goes, nope. He's the one that's in charge. After a season, Moses begins to appoint leaders and begins to give authority to them. But basically, we've got a theocracy that's got one leader. 
God still speaks, God still moves, God's still among his people. The fourth, we come into the conquest, all right? So the people of Israel morph from being just sort of a traveling nomadic people to a war machine, okay? So now we've got General Joshua, Joshua's in charge, and the structure now is a military, okay? So the people of Israel, they're moving into the sort of military government style in which a general is in charge of the people, God still speaks, God still moves, God still among his people. We move into the time of the judges. This is the fifth section there. We move into the time of the judges. It again moves towards an anarchy. The passage says that everyone did what seemed good in his own eyes, right? And it was kind of this theocracy thing. So God's in charge, but you've got a bunch of different tribes, and you've got men that lead the tribes, but there's not really a sense of voting. It's not a republic. It's nothing like that. God still speaks. God still moves. God is still among his people. We move to a divided monarchy. Am I getting, am I getting redundant here? All right. As we go through this, what we'll see is that whether it's a kingdom, whether it's an empire, which is a kingdom of kingdoms, whether it's tribalism, whether it's anarchy, whatever government system is in place, God still speaks, God still moves, and God is still among his people. I want to root this down first, because when we start getting into this passage a little bit about what Paul is going to talk about, it's going to really defy logic for a moment, and that's why we needed to go through this first, okay? Our nation, can I just address the elephant in the room? Our, our nation was brought about in a revolution. Anybody not know about that? Okay. Didn't have the representation we wanted. Fought a war over it. Tried to build a nation on godly principles. We all know that story, right? Okay, we didn't mention that for a second. We'll get back to the passage, okay? We'll get back to it. The Apostle Paul says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. All right, so this sermon series, we've been talking about heaven here on earth, right? We've been saying the Lord's Prayer. It goes, Our Father who art in heaven, what does it say? Holy be your name, right? Then what does it say? It says, Your kingdom come, your will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven right? And then Jesus says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And Jesus has invested authority in four different spheres of authority. The first is the individual. Everybody put your hand up. Put your right hand up. Okay, some of you just decided to do that and some of you didn't, right? You're an individual. You decide whether to move your right hand up or your left hand up. I can make a suggestion or instruction. You can choose to obey or not. As an individual, you have a special kind of sovereignty, then there's the sovereignty that's given to the church. The church speaks into the moral character of its congregants, of its members, and the nation of which it exists, whichever nation it exists in. That's the realm of the church. Then last week, we talked about the family. The last two weeks in a row, we talked about the family. God has given to family the responsibility to love and discipline children, to raise them up in the fear of the Lord. And then there's a fourth sphere, that of government. Now, people that founded our nation, when they read Romans 13, what they said was that, well, it only is talking about if you are dealing with a respectable leadership, if you are not dealing with a tyranny. They said, God would never expect you to live under a tyranny. They're kind of right and kind of wrong. We're going to explore how, okay? So if we have these spheres of authority, right? We've got the individual, we've got the church, we've got the family, and we've got the government. These are four different spheres of authority, and each has a different scope. Each has a different set of things that they're responsible for. Now, just as in Michigan, right? So Michigan, we have state laws, don't we? Okay. Does a federal law supersede a state law? Yes, right? So you've got a local ordinance, you can have a state law, and a federal law supersedes state law. I'm here to tell you that there's another law that supersedes federal law, and that's God's law. So we're going to be talking out of both sides of our mouth here. Okay, and I think this term that it begins with, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, is the key that we need to understand. Okay? 
Subjection, subject, is not the same as obedience. Let me say this again. Subjection is not the same as obedience. When God speaks to children, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You don't have to understand to obey. You just do what you're told to do. When he uses the term subject yourself, this is a conscious decision that a person that's individually sovereign decides to make. Is this clear? So obedience is do what I tell you no matter what. Subjection means I am going to submit myself to this authority. Understanding that, just like you got state law is superseded by federal law, is superseded by God's law. So as the Christian, we are in this spot in which we subject ourselves to every legitimate form of authority put over us, and we obey in every way that we can unless it conflicts with God's law. Obedience is commanded to children. Subjection acknowledges your agency. Okay? It's not that you aren't smart enough. It's not that you aren't gifted enough. It's not that you aren't capable enough. You may be smarter, more gifted, and more capable than an authority God has put over you in the form of government. All those things may be true. That's not what this is about. This says that God himself has established all authority... And that authority, it is still subject to God's law. It's it's just not subject to me. Is it subject to you? Now, we've got this really interesting nation that we've got here, right? Like, we've got this republic, and we, like, elect local officials and state officials, and and we kind of have a say in things, and we kind of don't, and it's... It's not directly, but here's the interesting thing. So our forefathers who founded this nation, they founded it and they said that, well, God would never call us to live under a tyranny. And here's where understanding the biblical context is going to make things a little uncomfortable for us. So Romans, the book of Romans, was written in the 60s AD, 60s after Jesus died. And it was written to Roman Christians who lived in the city of Rome. Well, who was in charge of Rome in the 60s AD? It was Nero. And Nero, at the writing of this, is about 20 years old. And Nero has two advisors. He has Seneca the philosopher. He advises him on things of philosophy. And then he had a military general that advised him on things of the military. Right? So Paul writes this letter in. You've got 20-year-old Nero. And you've got his two advisors, Seneca the philosopher. And he's got a military general that are his advisors. And right now... And Nero's been in charge for just a couple of years now. We don't know how bad it's going to get under Nero. As the years go by in this Romans teaching, Nero is going to develop into one of the most corrupt leaders the world has ever seen in every way. Like today, we say like, well, our leaders are corrupt because maybe they accept bribes. Our leaders are corrupt because they do this. Our leaders are corrupt because they do that. Well, Nero's like, hold my beer. So Nero kills his mom. Nero kills his first wife. He kills his second wife. He's the first emperor to marry a man. Nero takes the place of the wife in the marriage. Kills that guy. Then marries a boy that he had done despicable things to. Like, completely immoral in every aspect. It doesn't even people of today would say, like, that's off limits, right? In terms of his fiscal policy, like he just said, well, we're just not going to collect taxes anymore. Now, like Rome's like fighting a whole bunch of wars right now, so this is just crazy for them to go, oh yeah, we're not going to collect any taxes. And what we're going to do is we're going to build these huge like theaters that people will get killed in, like these gladiator deals. We're going to do that. And he goes, well, and what I'm going to do is I really want to do a building project here, and I can't like doze this, so we're just going to burn it down. So he burns down a section of the city, a whole bunch of people burn to death, like This is the leader that this is being written under. And you look at that, any reasonable person looks at that and you say, God established this guy? Like, we're we're supposed to be subject to to this governing authority? Like, how, how in any reasonable way would this ever make sense? 
In order to understand what's going on here, we have to go back to what we're looking at in biblical history. Regardless of government, that is an authority. God still speaks, God still moves, and God is still among us. This, my friends, is how the Christ follower can live under a government that seems to be going the wrong way and can still live out of all of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. The Christian can only reasonably live this way when we understand that God still speaks, God still moves, and God is still among us. There's a passage from Haggai chapter 2. You guys probably memorized most of Haggai, didn't you? You guys know all that book? Yeah, most of you, most of you probably don't know this all that well. I know I haven't memorized it. I'm in Haggai chapter 2. So what's happened in Haggai is the people of Israel, they were exiled to a country called Babylon. And there's a really wonderful book called Daniel in which you see how one young man tries to live in a really corrupt and evil nation as a government official. But after 70 years of exile, God brings the people back and they start building a temple. And there are some people that are looking at this temple and they are just heartbroken. They're absolutely gutted because they remember the old temple. They remember the way it used to be. They remember the worship. They remember the splendor. They remember the glory. And they look at this little pathetic hull of a temple and they are just grieving. And God is going to encourage them. And he's going to say, listen to this in verse 3. Who of you is left who saw this house, meaning the temple, who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now, be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. Remember that Exodus part where they're coming out of Egypt? This is what he covenanted with you. And listen to these words. And my spirit remains among you. You may have been exiled. You may have served under an empire that didn't understand you, that tried to stomp you out. You may have been in a place where they tried to take your, your practices away from you. They tried Daniel to, to change his dietary habits that were part of his religion. They tried to get these three young men to bow down and worship an idol. And the, and the whole world was trying to keep them from that. And what God says is, my spirit remains with you my friends no matter who is in authority god still speaks god still moves and god is still among you and so we take a page from the military's book and how we respond and deal with leaders how many of you have heard the phrase before i salute the rank but not the man some of you maybe who have some military backgrounds have seen some things like this, right? Like, if you're in the military service and you've got an officer who's above you, you don't have to like them, you don't have to think they're a swell person, you don't have to sing their praises, but when that person comes, you snap to attention, you still salute them. Why? Because we respect the rank and not the person. It's a lot easier when you can respect the person, for sure. But we respect the rank, not the character of the person wearing it. Why? Because the rank was established by God. Now, here's the interesting thing, my friends. There was this long, I mean, I wanted to take another hour and go with you about Jeroboam and Rehoboam. It's this story that would just like perfectly do it, but it takes like 45 minutes to read through it. I thought you guys might get mad at me if I read to you that long. But it's this story in which you've got 12 tribes of Israel, and they've all been under Solomon, the great and wise king. And Solomon is a boy named Rehoboam, and Rehoboam's a clown. He's a clown. And so he goes to all of his advisors, his father's advisors, and he's like, what do I do now that I'm the king? And he's like, go to the people and tell them that you are going to love them, and you're going to care for them, and you're going to you're gonna lower the burden that was on them. And he goes, okay, I hear you. Then he goes to his buddies, and what do his buddies say? His buddies are like, tell him your old man was nothing. Tell him like you're the original gangster, and they're going to be like, 
So what does Rehoboam do? He doesn't listen to his father's advisors. He goes off and he tells everybody, like, my dad was nothing. He's like, I'm going to whip you. My dad whipped you with scourges. I'm going to whip you with scorpions. And the people are like, later. <laughs> like, they're just like, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. And there's a prophet that comes along and he says, I'm going to take 10 of the tribes away from Rehoboam. And I'm going to give them to this other guy named Jeroboam instead. And when the civil war happens without a shot being fired, Rehoboam's guys, they get up because they're going to go fight the battle. Like, you can't just leave. In a civil war, you don't get to just leave. And God speaks to the people and he says, no, this is of me. This is of me. This is of me. Don't fight it. And those guys go, okay. Okay. This is from you. We're not going to fight it. And a civil war happens without a shot being fired. And that's how you get the divided kingdom between the north and the south and the people of Israel. It came from God's hand. In each of those areas, whether it was being in slavery in Egypt or being in slavery in Babylon or Persia or whoever, or the Romans being over us, no matter how difficult times get, no matter how evil the leaders can be, God still speaks, God still moves, and God is still among you. And that's how you and I can respect the, not the, we respect the rank and not the character of the person wearing it. Nero was evil, okay? And Nero was a punishment on his people that God brought. We see this happen again and again in the scriptures. They'll say that the people get evil. God will have an enemy come and rule them to punish them. And then he will raise up a leader and deliver them. This is the pattern that goes on through scripture again and again and again, generation after generation. And every person and every individual that fought against God's will in that, the passage says, sets themselves up as a rebel, not against the people they're rebelling against, but against Christ himself. Did I make this up or is this from the word? Let's hear, let's hear, the, let's hear the passages. Verse 1, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Typo? Nope, hit it again. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. We respect the rank, not the character of the person wearing it. We respect the rank, not the capability of the person wearing it. Remember I said that Nero, at 20, he's got capable advisors. They're going to set him up to run the nation the right way. And he fires them. He forced them out. He spends money in these festivals on buildings. And it says that if you look at the history books, they say he bankrupted Italy, which was hard to do. Italy was a wealthy place. He bankrupted it. We respect the rank, not the capability of the person wearing it. We respect the rank, not the charisma of the person wearing it. My friends, remember when I say that it's very difficult for me to follow somebody that I don't respect? I know that each of us deal with this in some sense, in some way. Each of us deal with this to a certain extent. Each of us want leaders who are just and righteous. Each of us want want to be able to pick our leaders. Here's the interesting thing. Remember my Rehoboam, Jeroboam story I just told you? Here's the interesting thing. Jeroboam was David 2.0. Do you know who David was? David was the high king. David was the one that everybody since then will be compared to, and everybody thought Jeroboam was going to be David number two. It says in the passage that David, that Rehoboam, uh, excuse me, Jeroboam, that what he did was he was part of building projects, and it says that he handled them so capably that Solomon promoted him. And there, there you go through seven or eight instances in which there's a prophecy that he's going to rule, and all the people love it. All the people want it. When Rehoboam goes out the deep end and then they get the kingdom, they go, yeah, we got our guy. We got our guy. We got the guy. He's not a clown like Rehoboam. This guy's built stuff. This guy's done stuff. This guy's capable. This guy's honest. This guy's everything. And you know what Jeroboam does? He builds two golden calves because he's an insecure leader. He's afraid that people will go back to worshiping at the temple, and he leads the people right off the cliff into idolatry. Here's the thing, my friends. 
you and I don't know anything about the future. We can look at a particular person and through our eyes we say, here's a person of integrity. Here's a person of capability. Here's a person of everything. And do you know what you and I don't know? We don't know what the crucible of power and authority will do to that person. Because here's the thing, when this passage was written, Nero still hadn't gone down that path of all of that nonsense that he was going to be involved with. He still had choices. He had good advisors. He had every possibility to make God-honoring choices. And he didn't. And neither did Jeroboam. And so, my friends, we as a people of faith, we as a community of faith need to humble ourselves and say, we do not know, we do not know what power and authority will do to people that we respect and that we think will, will do great things and will do this and will do that. We don't know anything. God is the one that sees all possibilities, all futures real and imagined. And so when God says that he's the one that establishes authority, we don't have to understand that. We don't have to know all of the future to know that if God has placed them in us, then we should subject ourselves to our leaders. Now here's something that we as Christians need to be very careful about. We need to be so careful. Look at the back of the passage. We're in 13.7. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. Listen to these two words. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. On my social media before the last election, I can't tell you how many Christ followers I saw putting up things, making fun of somebody's orange complexion skin and wavy blonde hair. I can't tell you how many people I saw do that throughout the media, through all these places. I can't see how many pictures of Nancy Pelosi I saw posted of her pictured in an unflattering light with a ridiculous look on her face. And these are Christ followers that are doing this. My friends, I'm not telling you that you have to like the policies of any individual. I'm not telling you that you have to stand by as, as horrible things are done to the unborn, abortion, these things. I'm not telling you you don't need to stand in the face of this. What I am telling you is that it is the Christ follower's responsibility to offer respect and honor to the people who are placed above us. We are called not to be rebels. We are called to be children of light. We are called to be the people that regardless of what's happening in the halls of government, walk in the faith and the courage by the Holy Spirit because God still speaks, God still moves, and God is still among you. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in any of those sorts of things that we see on the news. We don't have to be in terror. We don't have to be in fear because ultimately Jesus Christ is on the throne. Nero did not get to lead his way forever. He died at the age of 30. Rehoboam did not get to rule forever. He ruled for a couple of months and then God took it from him. Have a little bit of faith in your God that he knows what's best that he knows what's just, and he will put in authority who he will. And unlike teenage me, be as leadable as you would have others be to you. Let's pray. God, our Father, we come to you by the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. God, I know for myself, I need to repent. I know some of the things I said in the privacy of my own home about what I view the intelligence levels of people to be, what I view their character to be, and I was often disparaging and discouraging and often didn't pray for my leaders and often didn't provide them the respect and the honor that you have commanded me. I repent of my rebellion before you. God, I pray that we, your people, We'll walk and live by faith because we know that you still speak, you still move, and you are still among us. Jesus Christ has all authority on heaven and on earth, and we say, let it be so. God, I pray that you will move in us to be a people who are good citizens in our nation, that want what's best for our nation, that do everything we can to bring positive outcomes for our nation, but release the results to you. We thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. My friends, before I dismiss you and bless you, there's one thing I'd like to mention to you. Uh, please try to spread the word. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we're going to be having our pastoral vote. So this is when you guys will decide if you want me to continue as your pastor for the next season in ministry. Sometimes emails don't get to people. Sometimes mail gets lost. Please make sure that everybody's here because we want each person to have a chance to, uh, to share what the Holy Spirit has put on their heart as it pertains to uh, my future here with the church. Um, I say nothing to influence what your votes about me will be because my, honestly, my friends, my trust is completely in God. And I know, I know that he's got a plan for this church. I know that. I know that he intends to move by his spirit in this body and in this, move, in this thing that he's doing here. Um, so make sure that you come out. Uh, make sure that anybody that maybe doesn't check their email very much or whatever knows about it so they can be out here for it, okay? Cool? All right, everybody stand up. I'd like to bless you. May the God who still speaks, may the God who still moves, may the God who is still among you be your constant companion. May you walk by his spirit everywhere that you go. May you be filled with light and grace and mercy for the people around you. May you be valiant for truth. May you speak what the spirit gives you and may you do it everywhere you go. Go in peace, my friends.